Good morning. We'll be starting in about a minute. Good morning. I'm Jennifer Gross, CEO of American Friends of Tel Aviv University. I'm pleased to welcome you to today's webinar, Using the Brain in Business, three ideas from neuroscience that will change the way business is done. Our format this morning is a bit different than those that of our previous webinars. Today, we are featuring a Tel Aviv University alumnus, Dr. Moran Cerf, in conversation with Professor Uri Asheri, head of the Segal School of Neuroscience at Tel Aviv University. Dr. Cerf is a neuroscientist and business professor at the Kellogg School of Management and the Neuroscience Program at Northwestern University. In his work, Dr. Cerf helps individuals and businesses harness the current knowledge of the brain to improve thinking and understanding of customers and business decisions. His research uses methods from neuroscience to clarify the underlying mechanisms of our psychology, behavior changes, emotion, decision-making, and dreams. Dr. Cerf holds multiple patents and has published over 60 academic papers. He's also been featured in consumer outlets such as CNN, Bloomberg, NPR, Time, and MSNBC. Prior to his academic career, he held positions in pharmaceuticals, telecommunications, and software development. On the more colorful side, he spent years as a computer system hacker, breaking into financial and government institutions to test and improve their security. Dr. Cerf holds a PhD in neuroscience from Caltech and an MA in philosophy and a BS in physics from Tel Aviv University. Professor Asheri is the director of the Segal School of Neuroscience, a position he has held for the last nine years. He is a prominent neuroscientist who leads an interdisciplinary research team that focuses on the molecular mechanisms of learning and memory and health and in neurogenitive disease. Under Professor Asheri's direction, the Segal School has made Tel Aviv University a magnet for excellent researchers and students. It is the leading neuroscience institute in Israel with more than 150 research groups. Professor Asheri was educated at the Hebrew University and holds a BS in biology and chemistry with distinction and a PhD in neuro neurobiology cum laude. Dr. Cerf will give a brief presentation followed by Q&A session. Please feel free to send your questions in using the Q&A box on your screen and Dr. Cerf will attempt to answer as many questions as he is able to get to. It is now my pleasure to turn over the program and welcome Uri and Mohan. Thank you. Okay, so I will take it for the next 20 minutes with a kind of quick overview of those three ideas from neuroscience that I thought would be relevant to the audience. And then we're gonna open it for questions, as, as you said. And I wanted to start by saying the following. I have a little piece of paper that I have in front of me with a note and the note is only two words and those are speak slow. So I tend to speak fast, uh, particularly when I get excited about a topic. So this will surely happen. Uh, if you think that there's a buffering issue on your end, it's not, it's actually how I speak and the computer just is unable to maintain that. I'll do my best and uh, hopefully uh, I catch myself at any time that I go out of the legitimate miles per hour and slow down. So as you learned, I'm a professor at Kellogg and Kellogg is a business school. I'm a neuroscientist. The fact that a neuroscientist sit in a business school is, 
unusual. There aren't that many of us. In fact, Tel Aviv University is one of the few other schools on top of Kellogg that actually has a neuroscientist on their faculty. Dr. Dino Levy, a colleague of mine, a great friend, uh, was uh, starting his career there just when I started my career at Kellogg. And the idea is that there is an expansion of the interest that business school have in not just understanding how people make decisions by looking at their choices and behaviors, but also by looking at the neural mechanisms that drive those. So as an example that kind of is illustrating that, if you run a survey and the survey maybe has a question that says, how much do you like product uh, one? And you can choose anything from one to 10. One is I don't like it and 10 is I love it. And someone comes to the survey and they are confused. They say, I don't really know, maybe six, maybe eight. I'm not really sold on the product. I'm just gonna select seven. When you look at the survey, you have no idea whether the seven that they circled reflects them saying, yeah, I just like it a seven, or whether they are somewhere between five and a 10, six and an eight, and they kind of chose some average of that. You don't know, the survey looks the same to you. But if you had access to their brain while they were addressing the questions, you can see this confusion, you can see this uh, bafflement, you can learn something about the thought process that led to the answers. And more and more, what neuroscientists are showing is that many times, if you can actually get access to the brain processes that drive the answer, you have a better understanding of the person's actual drivers and better predictions of outcomes. So if you know that they're not sure, you can change something to make them even more certain and then they're gonna actually buy the product or not. You can actually see why is it that they're confused and you can do things that will help them really go in the direction that they, you, you want them by understanding how they think. So neuroscience is the way to get access to how people think, decide, uh, feel, uh, actually experience the world. And in doing that, you really get an understanding of the customers if you're in marketing, the managers or yourself if you are one, and that's if you're studying management. And if you're studying accounting, you can actually look at how the brain processes the complex equations that lead to a decision. For example, if you have to look at a far in advance temporal decisions, you can see why is it the brain fails to think about the future differently than it thinks about the present. And I can go on and on strategy and other fields that all use neuroscience as one additional tool that supplements the existing one. The result is that there is now more and more neuroscientists with background like myself in business schools that try to add and supplement the existing methods of research with understandings of the brains. Now, before I go into the three ideas, I wanna say something about the customers of that. The reason this is growing is because there are more and more industries that are interested in that and are summoning our research to their use. So I sit mainly in the US. In the US, the primary customers of our research are Silicon Valley and the entertainment business. So Silicon Valley, companies like Google, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, they're eager to understand their customers better, to figure out how attention works, how you can make a person want something or not want something that they don't like, how you can actually align reality to people's desires. And therefore they are hiring more and more neuroscientists to the marketing or to the management ranks so they can actually use our research and help them do better job in figuring out what customers want or how to make decisions better. Hollywood is a secondary big uh, customer of our research. They're interested in understanding how attention works and how to make content that will be more appealing to you. So when they're making a movie, up to now it was the director's own preferences that decided how the movie is gonna be cut and what will be the ending, but now they actually run focus groups of brains where they have people come to the room, they show those people some versions of the movie, let's say, look at their brains and they see at what point is the brain getting confused? At what point is the brain uh, getting excited? And they can know something about what the experience would be by looking at the brains and then how they cut the movies. Recently, in light of the uh, elections in the US that are coming, there's actually more and more interest by politicians in understanding how the brain works. So you'll see more and more parties that actually hire a neuroscientist to look at speeches before they get uh, released, to look at commercials and ads that are public service ads that are supposed to get you to vote and understand how they work. So there's more and more interest in people looking at content and how the brain experiences it in such a way that tells us what works and what doesn't work, how engaging it is. And because those large corporates 
are now driving the wagon into this domain, you see more and more small industries that are also following suit and are interested in kind of using that. So my aim in the next 15 minutes is to give you three examples. It will show you how fascinating it is and what can be done with that in every industry that you're in, such that you can also take it and make a use of that. And with that in mind, I'm gonna start with the first idea that I think is gonna change our coming years in business that's based on recent work in neuroscience. So about 10 years ago, neuroscientists shifted entirely their uh, way of describing memory in the brain. We always knew that memory doesn't work as simply as we kind of spoke about in the books, and now we have more and more evidence. And I boil it down to the following idea. For a while, we used the analogy that memory is kind of like a file vault. You go to an experience, you create a memory, you store this memory in the file, and that's it. From then on, it sits there, and when you want to use the memory, you just load the file and speak about the memory. When you're done, you put it back, and that's it. This is an outdated view of memory. The more uh, correct way of looking at memory is such that memories are adaptive and malleable even when they're inside your head. So if you right now are sitting with me and going through this experience of learning something, you create a memory of this experience that gets stored in your brain. So far, exactly like the previous model. But here is the, the difference. If tomorrow someone asks you to tell them what you did this afternoon or evening, depends where you are, you will now load the memory from your vault and you will describe it in words. And as you do that, you will expose the memory to changes. Your momentary experience, how you are at that moment emotionally, what words you use, what other person's uh, responses you experience, will leak into the memory, such as when you're done using the memory, you will overwrite the original one with a new version that is a little bit different based on the experience you had when you told the story. So now the memory that you have is not long, longer the original, but it's a version of that that's modified a little bit. And if two days after someone asks you to tell them the same story, you will load the modified version and maybe put it up for grabs such that it can change again and then rewrite again. And over time, as you use memory more and more, you actually are making it more vulnerable and more likely to change. This is interesting because it means that we can actually use that to change your preferences over time by overwriting your original preferences with different ideas, which is relevant for business if you want to change someone's minds. So here's an example of a study that two colleagues of mine ran a few years ago that we're now modifying that shows how easy it is to do that and how risky it is. In the original study, two people come to the lab and they're viewing images. So imagine that you're a subject in this experiment, you sit in, in, in front of me and I show you two pictures on little cards of two, let's say, men you don't know. So there's two pieces of faces, and I ask you a simple question, of those two, who do you find more attractive? The guy on the right or the guy on the left? You look at them and you say, I don't really know them, they all look relatively similar to me, but I'm gonna choose the right person. And then I give you the card that you chose, and I ask you to hold it in your hand and explain to me in one sentence why you picked this person. So you might say, mm, I really like his smile. You say, fantastic, keep the card, let's choose a new one. And then we load two different cards, two different men. Again, we define more attractive, you make a choice, you get the choice, you have to explain it, and you do it again and again. And there's a trick in this experiment. And the trick is that every now and then, occasionally, the card that you chose is not the one I give you. So you choose this card and I use sleight of hands to give you the other one. So you get the card you didn't select. And what we show is that people actually don't notice that they receive the other option. And that not only do they not notice that they receive the other thing, they also explain the choice they didn't make. They get card B, even though they chose card A, and they say, uh, I like this guy because he has a beautiful hairstyle. So people essentially, in the course of about 10 seconds, take a choice that they didn't make, copy the answer for it, and overwrite the original with a new one. And what we show in a modified recent version of the experiment is that if you do this transition, not only do you take the choice and go with it, you also, if I bring you back to the lab two weeks after and ask you again to make a choice between those same options, you will now choose the other one because you wrote in your mind a new reality that you now committed to. Think about it in the context of business. You are part of an experiment where you go to the supermarket with a list of items that you're supposed to buy. It says milk and bread and yogurt. And you go into the aisles and you see the milk and there's 1%, 2%, and you choose the 2% and you put it in your basket and you keep shopping for stuff and you go to the checkout. And at some point when you kind of are buying the customers, your, re, your, your 
buying the milk, not realizing that I snuck into your basket between the moment you made a choice and the moment you get to check out, and I replaced the 2% with 1%. You're very likely to actually buy the thing that you didn't choose. Not only that, if I stopped you on the wire outside and I said, I'm a, a marketing researcher and I wanna know why you chose the 1% milk, you will not say, I don't know, or I didn't. You will actually come up with an answer that is why you chose this thing and commit to it so much so that you're gonna actually tomorrow buy the 1% yourself and generally create a new story in your mind that builds on the memories that you have that are not yours, that says that this is the reality. So the first idea that I wanted to share with you is that we have now evidence that we can actually relatively easily with simple manipulations make you write new memories into your own brain with our aid that overwrite the existing ones and create a new narrative for you because if you think about it philosophically, most of our life is the collection of our memories. We tell our story by loading all the memories and weaving them into a pattern. So in a way, by changing small things, I can actually make you go in different directions. And as we work with companies right now, we're checking the kind of viability of this in different domains. And what comes up again and again is that it seems surprisingly too easy to make a person change their minds, not just in small choices like two people you don't know or uh, milk, but even things that we feel are inherent to who we are. We can elaborate later on what's the extreme version of it and how easy it is to do it. But the message I wanted to, to leave you with is that there's one key moment in this experience that I want you to all remember that is critical. And that's the moment when I ask you why. So when I give you the card you didn't choose, if you just take it and move on, nothing will happen. You won't overwrite the memory. But if I ask you, tell me why, and you're gonna come up with a story, that's when you actually do the overwriting. So in a way for all of us, the moment we feel that we need to come up with a story to explain and narrate our decisions is the moment we actually overwrite a memory. And in that sense, the forcing of a person to explain their behavior is a key moment that makes them generate a new reality for themselves. That's what idea number one. Quickly, idea number two and three. Idea number two is to me one that could really shape the entire uh, uh, decade easily if gone in the wrong direction. And we have to choose right now if we want it to go there or not. And that's the idea that uh, my colleagues and I are calling sensory addition. This is not a formal name. You will find other colleagues calling it differently, but behind it lies the notion that we can actually create new senses for humans. So all of you have a brain and this brain sits in a body and the body has multiple sensing organs. You have your skin, your nose, your ears, your eyes, your tongue. Those are all devices that sample the outside world, turn it into the language of the brain, and then the brain makes meaning out of it. The brain doesn't really see the world or smell the world or hear the world. It sits in a dark, quiet, uh, watery uh, place. And all it knows about the world comes from the senses that feed information from the outside in the language of the brain. The brain calls what the eyes send in its language, seeing. It calls what the ears send in its language, hearing, and so on. And recently we learned that people who lost senses can regain those senses because we can build devices that replace them. So if you became deaf at some point in your life, not because your brain is not working well, but because your ears don't work well, we can now build a cochlear implant, a device that basically replicates the way your ears work by less listening to molecular vibrations in the air and turning those into the language of the brain and then blasting the brain with a signal that the brain within a few months learn to make meaning out of. So the new ear, the cochlear implant, isn't a ear biologically. It's a device that does similar things to what the ears do. And it sends signals to the brain in a similar fashion, but not exactly the same. And what we learn is that within seven to nine months, roughly, the brain relearns how to interpret the new signal and make meaning out of it. So the brain learns to hear by just getting new signal into the right place and finding content and meaning in it which leads us to understanding that the brain is really good in finding meaning in signals all over the place. If you blast the brain with complex signals that have some meaning in them, the brain will figure it out. And this is what led my colleagues to take it one step higher and ask the question, can we fit into the brain new senses, new things that weren't there before and have the brain learn to do those? Nature is full of animals that have different sensing organs. Bats echolocate and they can actually sense the world by sending a pulse that returns and that's how they hear the world. Their brain works in the same fashion as our brain. Of course, it's smaller and it's made from a little bit different uh, circuits, 
but the essence of the signal is that the ears of the bat send the content and the brain passes it. Birds have magnets in their brain that actually uh, figure out the magnetic fields of Earth. So when they fly, they can know exactly when. And their brain just feels north. And nature is full of other devices. Snakes have heat beats. So snakes see the world in kind of blue and red colors and they know where you are, even if you're hiding behind a tree because they can sense it and their brain, similar to ours, knows how to pass that. And the question that my colleagues ask first was, can we take the eyes of the snake, let's say, plug them into the brain of a human, wait nine months and have a human learn to see infrared or plug the uh, echolocating ears of the bat into the human brain and have a brain learn to echolocate. Now this was not done. The closest we did was a trial with monkeys that actually created monkeys that can see different colors by taking different uh, sensors and plugging into their eyes. But it gave rise to a field that actually has relevance to business. And that's what I'm gonna end this example where we take existing sensors and feed data into them and use the brain to solve them. So if you're a subject in this experiment, and right now we're replicating it in different ways, what happens is that you get a vest. This is a, a work of a colleague of mine, Professor David Eagleman from Stanford. You put a vest on you, the vest has multiple motors on it, and you're starting the experiment by feeling something. So the motors are turned on, and suddenly you feel pressure, say on your uh, left shoulder and in your belly. And then a tablet in front of you pops up with two arrows that ask for this choice that you just had. Do you wanna go left or right? So you might say, I have no idea. It's just a feeling in my body. So they tell you, just make a guess and you guess right. And then you get feedback. And the feedback says, correct. For this choice that you just made, you just uh, chose the correct answer. Let's uh, continue to the next one. And again, you feel different uh, uh, patterns of uh, pressure in your body by the motors. Two arrows appear. You make a choice this time left and you get again feedback that says correct or incorrect. And you did it again and again. And what they show in the experiment is that in the beginning, people just guess. They have no idea what they're doing. But over time, they start finding meaning in it. Their brain does this amazing thing that it's made for, which is find signal in the cacophony of, of information that comes into it. And ultimately, it figures out that when you feel something on your right shoulder and on the left side of the belly and in your back, you should go right. And if you feel something else, you should go left. And they start actually doing better than chance. They start doing a good job in figuring out what's going on. Now, unbeknownst to them, the pattern that they feel in their body are not random. It's not that they're just feeling something pressure without any meaning. What David did was he took the S&P 500, the stock exchange data, and fed that into their body. And what they're making are buy and sell choices. So they're actually trading stocks based on feeling in their body that corresponds to the stock exchange. They have no idea what they're doing. They just think that they're making choices right and left based on feelings, but actually they're trading stocks. And what he shows is that some of them outperform traders in the market just by feeling the market. If you show the data in a really complex screen with tons of data, it's very, very hard. But if you feel it, your brain is made to find meaning in it. And what we're doing right now is we're playing with all kinds of different data, marketing data, strategy data, information from drones, information from cars, all kinds of data that all are fed to the body in different ways. And the brain is using those to find meaning in that and actually help you solve problems. So the idea I'm, I'm promoting here is that many of you are doing business analytics right now, data processing, data analytics. Right now, using complex machine learning and AI algorithms to find meaning in them might go back to using the brain to solve, solve those, but not in the old fashioned way where you think about the problem and actually make decisions, but rather use the intuitive components of the brain to feel the data, to sense it. And essentially the market will become a new sense for you. Or a cybersecurity problem will be a feeling. You will feel pain in your back when someone is hacking into your system and you just know that something is wrong because the feeling is different right now. And essentially we can start plugging the world into our body and learning how to intuit answers without necessarily having the cognitive understanding of what drives them, but be able to solve them. Since Israel is a huge industry in solving analytics problems, this could be a huge business for a lot of companies that can harness the power of big data and the brain. And the third and final idea that I'm gonna finish with that I think is a remarkable and gonna change again some industries in the next 10 years is the idea of a big picture looking at sleep and making meaning out of sleep and understanding it and smaller and more interesting right now i think for those of you in the entertainment business is uh, accessing dreams so dreams are a fascinating entity 
Uh, all of us are fascinated by it. The Bible is full of stories about people who interpret dreams. Uh, wars were wages were waged uh, because of those poetries full of people waking up with their dreams. And you don't have to go far. If you wake up and you tell your spouse about a dream you had about someone that's not them, they might be angry at you in the real world just because they say, what do you mean like you had a dream about not me? How does it work? Like you somehow felt held responsible for your dreams. So we all feel the dreams are meaningful. Yet up until the last 20 years, we didn't really have access to them. So despite all the interesting insights from people like Freud and Carl Jung and, and many others, they didn't really see dreams. They got the report that the people provided to them when they woke up. And what we learned recently is that the story you tell about your dreams is not complete. You might forget facts, you might make up facts, like the story that you tell about your dreams isn't really the dream itself. And Freud and Jung and others didn't really have access to the dream because they didn't have the tools to look at the brain while people were dreaming. They had to wait for you to wake up and report those. But now neuroscientists are getting closer and closer to having access to the dream content itself. We can now extract the visual of the dream when you're dreaming. We can actually extract the semantic content when you're dreaming. Not only that, we can actually navigate your dream while you're dreaming. We can actually nudge you with smells or tactile experiences and actually make you dream different things. So we are now for the first time getting readout of the dream content, manipulating them so we can change bad dreams to good or at least give you some content that you want. And where I see this going is towards a new commodity where dreams become a thing that people can use. You can actually go to sleep with a dream by Spielberg or you can actually go to sleep and say, I really want to see my uh, old great grandmother that I didn't see because she died years ago in my life. And suddenly the dream summons her and you get to talk to her. You actually get to share a dream with your partner. So you go to sleep side by side and instead of retiring to your own world, you share experiences. Now these are not done yet, but the engineering feat that we're all kind of looking into right now suggests that we can do a lot more to dreams than we thought we could do 10 years ago. And I feel that in the next coming years, entire world of industries that are now giving us virtual reality experiences that are interesting, but you can always do this and get out of, will actually take over our sleep and give us not only much richer experience that we feel is reality, but also a new type of TV and film that actually happens when we sleep. And essentially a usage of dreams to create a richer experience for us uh, throughout. With that, I'm going to end and open it up for uh, Uri and you guys' questions about any ideas, those three and uh, others that I think would be relevant to anyone who's interested in the brain or interested in applying neuroscience in their fields. I think that it's mute. I think it's your mute, Uri. Okay. But I will answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks a lot, uh, Moran. It was really fascinating and exciting. And thank you all for being us, uh, with us today. I'm sure there are plenty of questions. So I'll be happy if you can also send me some questions through the q and I'll try to uh, screen them and, uh, and hopefully I can uh, uh, you know, uh, present most of them. One thing that I, before I'll go to the questions and, and uh, answer, one thing that uh, is fascinating, I think is your uh, really interdisciplinary background, starting as in physics, going to philosophy, uh, neuroscience, business. And in a way, this is exactly what we are doing here at the Segal School of Neuroscience, bringing uh, researchers coming from all disciplines. And I think if we want to go to the next breakthrough, similar to what you have been presenting today, we need really the, the, the the researchers, the clinicians, the engineers, coming from all disciplines to come together, think about the questions and tackle them from both direction. And I think that you have everything in one mind. So this is a great. This is something I think uh, to take as a, as a message. Uh, but let me start with uh, some uh, questions. I think that you started uh, to speak about uh, decision, decision making. And later on, you spoke about changing uh, your thought, your, uh, uh, your memories. So, you know, a general question that might be of interest to many of us. So some, some of us, and I think this is a, a great deal of, of people have problems in making decisions. So it's something that you do daily, but in, in some cases it's, it's really tough. So do you think that uh, 
similar to changing your memories. It will be possible to train like with some neurofeedback and allow uh, people to improve their decision and making. And I think this will improve their, you know, way of life tremendously. Absolutely, that's a great question. So, so I'll, I'll answer it shortly because I can say so much about it. I think that uh, many of us neuroscientists who are working in business are trying to get access to people that are in senior positions of decision so we can study how they make decisions. And this is a really interesting venture and there's some works with CEOs of companies and uh, military leaders that make rapid snap decisions while their brains are being scanned using devices like EEG or fMRI uh, that allow us to peek into their brain from the outside without actually going invasive. And what we see is that generally, let's take a message, there isn't an answer on how you make good decisions overall, but there is one for you as a person. So what I mean by that is that of the large audience we have today, some of you make decisions better in the morning, some better in the evening, some better when you're hungry, some when you're full, some when you're alone, some with others, some just before the deadline, some uh, hours ahead. And each of you has a brain profile that's best for them. So it's not that like making decisions in the morning is best for everyone, but for each and every person, there is a set of criteria that makes it even better for them in terms of making decision. And if you can afford a resource wise or time wise, the ability to actually study your own preferences, you will learn what is your ideal brain profile and you can tailor the world to make decisions in those states. And I'll give you one minute a, a way to do that. Of course, if you can go to Mr. Gold School and meet one of Uri's colleagues and have them look at your brain and give you insights on your decision making processes by actually looking inside, that's ideal. This would give you the most uh, kind of invasive direct input. But if you cannot, there's a simple thing that I think everyone can do that will be useful. And that is keep a diary for a short period of time and then evaluate. So what I mean by that is for the next 10 days, take a little piece of paper with you, live your life, and every time you have a decision, just write down what were the options and what were the conditions. So if you're going to a restaurant and someone offers you the salad, the salmon and the steak, and you have to choose, you write down, I was in a restaurant, it was 2 p.m. I was with these people and I was not nervous at all. These are the three options and I made a choice to go for the salmon. And you just write down a number of choices and then say 10 days after, you look back at the diary and then you rank them. And you say, salmon was a fantastic choice, 10 out of 10. The choice to uh, go see my friends at 9 p.m. when I was already tired, bad choice. And you kind of write, write that. When you look at the week prior, 10 days prior, and you evaluate them, you will see patterns. You will see every time I make choices that I don't like, I'm with these people, or it's this time of the day, or I'm under stress. And even without neuroscientists, you will get some intuition on what works for you and what doesn't. And that's a good way to at least start with getting a profile of your best decision making. Great. So I think you, you gave uh, your two cents, which was, I think, much more than that, in this uh, few, few minutes. So let, let me shift a little bit to uh, what you spoke about, or what you mentioned about uh, changing your memories. And I'll, I'll you know, divide it into maybe two, uh, two parts. So when, you know, some of the questions arrived from the audience, uh, I'll add uh, a little bit uh, uh, in addition to that. So, you know, one possibility is really to, you know, manipulate a little bit uh, slightly your thought that you will buy uh, uh, this drink instead of the other, which is a uh, one nice thing. But uh, can we try and use it? And is it been uh, uh, used in order to treat, for example, uh, post-traumatic uh, people or people with depression or something uh, that happened to them and really affect their way of life? So that, that will be, I think, a, a question that uh, will be relevant for many people. Absolutely. So, so I think that the answer would be in two sentences. One is the reason we do this research is exactly what you said. The, the reason this research is sponsored and is advanced is because we realize that we can change memories across the board. We can make you take a bad experience that your brain keeps re repeating and reliving without getting the ability to get out of and somehow nudge you out of it. That is the reason we do that. And the tying of that to what I mentioned in the end about dreams shows that we can actually keep doing this process of changing memories and actually altering them even when you're not awake. So this makes it even faster. So the research is done for that reason. And that is, I think, important. And I think that in a way, without kind of going too much into uh, the clinical component of that, I would say that for those of you who see therapists, in a way that therapist 
is doing that to you. They ask you when you go to meet them to tell them a story about something that bothers you. In doing that, they actually make you load the memory and then they intervene. They offer you a different framing, they offer you a different perspective, and then you save it over the original one and do something that changes the memory. And when you come back next time, they ask you the same question and they keep changing it. And over a period of say six meetings, you already have different framing of a bad experience. This is why therapy works because we can actually do it in a coordinative way. And I will say one thing and then I'm gonna uh, uh, finish that my two colleagues who came up with this uh, study originally, now 15 years ago, Peter Johansson and Lars Hall, they're in Sweden, with a very basic one that you can just change uh, ideas, have taken it in the last 15 years way outside of just showing you different pictures of small things and kind of changing them. They went to really realms that we think are at the core of who we are, like political choices or preferences when it comes to partners that we know personally. And they show that with small steps, you can actually change big memories. So my kind of call for the audience is to think about it as a positive thing that could actually be used by a lot of us to make our experiences better or a powerful tool that can be used by people that are not aligned with our interest to change our mind. And the call for the people who listen to us right now is to think what kind of role they want and how they wanna use it, if they wanna regulate it, if they wanna have it free, because up to now scientists have been exploring that for good and for bad, but we're not the ones deciding, it's you who decide. And I think that the point is that everyone in this kind of experience needs to think about their view and make a choice on that. I think we can come back to that uh, later on about other effects. But you mentioned therapists. The, the only problem is that it takes them a lot of time and us a lot of money until something changes. So let's sw maybe switch to uh, another angle of, of uh, you know, changing memories. If, you know, if we are changing our memories daily or uh, if one can manipulate our memories. So what is the scientific? Is there any scientific validation for a polygraph, for example, in these days? Ooh. What is the notion about this so so okay so i'm a uh, part of a small group of scientists uh, we call ourselves the neural law group that basically tries to uh, take neuroscience into the legal domain and we fail repeatedly and it boils down to the following we actually try to run studies that look at ways to detect lies or even detect familiarity so you don't have to know that the person is lying you just show them five weapons and you see that their uh, familiarity centers light up when you see the gun that was actually shot and you say okay they know something about this gun so even that would be a good lie detection tool but the bottom line is that every now and then when we think we have something we go to the legal system and i just was in a meeting with a state judge in new york not long ago where he basically said look we have this amazing tool that can help you know if someone was in the crime scene and the judge said right away, leave me, not interested. And his argument, which was valid, he said, you guys, neuroscientists, came to me in the 1930s, so to speak. And you said, we can know the truth by tapping people's heads and the phrenology was the time and knowing that there's bumps here. And this is how you know that it's true. And then you came back to me 20 years later and said, no, this was wrong, but EEG is the way to go. And now we know with EEG. And then you came to me in the 80s and you said, no, it's not EEG, it's fMRI. And now you say it's a different one. I would wait for you guys to agree on something for at least 40 years continuously before I will take it as an admissible evidence in the courtroom. And I think it's a valid argument. We don't know enough about the brain to uh, feel confident ourselves, even though as scientists, we're eager to claim, kind of put a, a flag on the moon every time we feel that our results work. And the real world is somehow a little bit skeptic and says, I'll wait for you to guys uh, agree among yourselves. So that's kind of the, the real life experience of what we do. So let me take you to the uh, NASDAQ uh, investment that you mentioned. So do you think that, uh, well, I'm not sure whether you had a, a enough uh, experience that uh, you see differences between the person pr profession and his ability to, you know, to feel and uh, invest in NASDAQ. So would the answer uh, be better in that? That might be a good way to have some income during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So I will say the following, uh, in our data set that is relatively small, we are replicating it right now. Uh, it seems that trade traders like experts are still the top. So they beat, so, so occasionally we would have one person who actually beats the traders, but this could still be statistically a mistake or, or insignificant. Like we don't see that a shift that like novices that wear this vest or we tried with also with bracelets or with all kinds of other tools actually kind of shift entirely. They, they do much better than they do when they just kind of see the data on tables, but they don't beat the experts. But we see one group that seems to outperform and it's a strange phenomenon that I can come up with an answer right now, but we don't know if it's true and that is kids. So it seems that kids, when they do this experiment, I'm talking 10 year olds, 
they put the vest or the bracelet on them and they try to trade stocks, they're the ones who show significantly higher improvement compared to everyone else. Maybe they are, their brain is more plastic and that's why they're taking any change and they're learning on the go all the time without having any judgment. Maybe there's something about uh, the data that is really appealing to them, like they kind of, their senses are more heightened. I don't know the answer, but what we're investigating right now is, is there a period in your life where you're even more likely to do that? And I think it's interesting uh, in one sentence, I would say, because we think that trading, training traders takes learning accounting and learning finance and learning a lot of things about economics before we get there. And this requires calculus for 12 years and then undergrad and then maybe a little bit more experience in uh, the financial trading before you get there. But if kids can do something without that, it means that the signal is inherently containing of the information and we might find a different route to that avoids all the learning and just does a good job. It's fascinating. I wanna kind of disclaim everything I said just now because it's so, new right now that I don't know if it's even going to hold, uh, but it's potentially a new kind of way of looking at like data as a thing that uh, people with a fresh mind will do better than those who were rigid in the last 15 years in their thinking. So a question that uh, came from the audience is, do you see connection between your finding and reported impacts uh, of hypnosis? So hypnosis is an interesting phenomenon. Uh, the statistics on how many people can actually go through the process uh, is somewhere below 20%, 12%. So, so many of us, if we went through the process, it might not work on us. And some are very likely. And I, I don't know enough about like, what makes you more or less likely to, to kind of be uh, suggestive. Uh, and we know that when you're hitting this stage, there are research on people under hypnosis, your brain looks like one of the uh, stages of sleep that we have clear familiarity with. And the same stage of sleep is something that people can access if they can lucid dream. So there seem to be converging states that all show that there are some people that can be relatively easily hypnotized. They can also wake up while they're sleeping, while they're dreaming and still maintain their dream, but also consciousness, lucid dream. And I guess those people are very, very good subjects for studies where you can actually commun communicate to them while they're dreaming and help them teach us something about dreams. But we didn't learn how to make everyone do that. So if you don't kind of work under these conditions, it might not work for you. And that's until we find out what makes it happen. You, you mentioned uh, dreams and I think uh, uh, in your uh, other uh, 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 talk that you gave that you mentioned that you, know, you can change your behavior while exposing your for, for different uh, uh, things. Like if you're uh, talking about uh, a smoker, if you uh, let him uh, uh, smell the nicotine and then you give him to smell a rotten egg, he might stop uh, smoking. Uh, do you need to do that while he's dreaming that he's smoking or can you evoke his uh, thought about it but just uh, you know having some uh, uh, nicotine smell in, near his bed? So this is a work of a colleague of mine from Israel, Anat Arzi, who did this research, and since then followed by a number of other colleagues of ours, that all boils down to the question, can we change something in your mind while you're sleeping? That's the big question. And the variety of things that they tried move from making you stop smoking to making you choose things when you wake up. We're now playing with making you actually choose passwords. So we kind of inject an idea into your mind. And then when you wake up, we ask you to choose a password randomly and you choose a random password, but actually part of the password were things that we injected into your mind when you're sleeping and you think it's yours, but actually it was influenced by something that we did to you before. And there's a group of people who try to teach you things. So can you go to sleep and wake up knowing Kung Fu? All of those things boil down to trying to use sleep as a commodity and do something to you. And all those works try basically to do the same things in two states, in the dream state and in the non-dream state. They call them REM, rapid eye movement, which is likely to be a moment where you're dreaming, and non-REM, the other type. So, so if you think of a sleep, there are kind of, while you're sleeping, there are things that happen in your brain that are different. And all the studies try to test what happens if you do it in dream and not dream. I can kind of make a list of what does and what does not work, but it seems that memory changes work primarily in a moment we call slow wave sleep, which is not dreams. And some manipulations that actually affect your behavior when you wake up, uh, not memories, but cho choices only work at dreams. So it seems that over the night, your brain does different things. 
Sometimes it kind of strengthens memories. Sometimes it creates new ones. Sometimes it rehearses the futures. And if you tackle the brain in the right time, you can change the behavior. And if you do it in the wrong time, you will totally screw up everything. So if you try to influence people's decisions while memories are being we, we kind of consolidated, you will just not do anything. But if you do the same thing at a different time, it will work. So it calls for a need for all of us to actually now start not monitoring the sleep as in I'm awake and I'm asleep, but also what stage I'm in and then do things. And I think that that is my guess, the next frontier of a lot of uh, neuroscience in business where companies are gonna start offering us devices that would sit next to our bed and not just monitor whether we're sleeping or awake, but also what stage we're at and will do things to us, like make us uh, wake up in the right time or uh, change our bad dreams to have good ones or do things to us that will actually affect our sleep while we're still asleep. Let's see whether we have enough time in, in a few minutes to come back to this uh, fascinating direction. But since the, you know, one of the, the title of, uh, of this talk was uh, business and, and neuroscience, so I would like to go back to, 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 to business area. And, and, and if you can uh, tell us a few cases, uh, examples of companies that have applied neuroscience and see changes uh, shift in their sales. Sure. So I, I can quickly run over one or two examples that I was involved with. So uh, one industry I mentioned that is really eager to use neuroscience is the film industry, Hollywood. And they right now are using a lot of our work to look at trailers for movies and how to uh, make the trailers even more fascinating so people can watch them. You can think about that instead of trailer as a commercial on TV or a, a political speech, you give the neuroscientist a piece of content, like a 30 seconds or a three minutes video. The neuroscientists run it by a lot of brains and they give you back feedback that says, in second number 55, things were a little bit more boring. In second number 77, people didn't remember what happened. So you can change something and, and that's that. What Hollywood is using it mainly is to figure out how to organize trailers in the movie theater. So basically they say, if you watch trailer number one, is a trailer for comedy, your brain is already in a mood that's positive. If I show you afterwards a trailer for say a horror film, you're much more likely to actually remember both. But if I show you afterwards a trailer for drama, you will remember only the drama, but not the whole film. So they kind of organize the mix of trailers by having us look at all the trailers in different orders and tell them which ones lead to more memory activation, to more engagement, to more emotions, and, and basically a better improvement. So that's one example. I'll give you another one, quick one. Uh, we work with a uh, Ferrari, the car company in Italy. This was pre-pandemic. Now it's been halted for a while on trying to see if we can actually connect the brain to the car. So right now your car has tons of dials and gadgets in it. And uh, the way it works is that if let's say a car comes from your right and about to hit you, you see it with your eyes, you process that, you might look at your dials to see what your speed, then you start kind of processing this in your brain from the visual areas to the decision-making areas to the motor areas before you give the instruction to actually slam the brake and then you slam the brake and then it takes maybe a, a few fraction of a second for the car to slow down. This could take about a third of a second from the moment you saw something to the moment you actually responded just because of the way the processes happen in our brain. They asked the question, can we connect the car to earlier processes in your brain? So as soon as you are clearly identifying danger, the car is gonna start slowing down on its own. And before you even become conscious of the danger, your car is already gonna start slowing down and giving you maybe 60 miles per hour difference, which could be a difference between uh, being dead or alive in some cases. So that's one example of a car connected to the brain as a brain machine interface, a company using neuroscience to, con to figure out content. And a lot of other companies in Silicon Valley are using uh, those uh, devices to essentially connect your uh, brain to the world and give you information. So you may have heard about uh, Elon Musk's recent initiative, the Neuralink, and that's just the more visible one, but Facebook acquired a company that I was involved with called Control Labs not long ago, and other companies are doing the same thing. They're trying to find ways for your brain to access the cloud and just think a thought that will summon information. So the idea would be that you drive your car and you normally wanna know how to get to the, uh, I don't know, Mercedes Azrieli in Israel, and you're not sure how to get there, you open your phone and you type the address and you kind of get instructions on your phone. Instead of doing it on your phone, you will think the thought, I wanna to go to this particular place and your brain is gonna reach out to the cloud, ask the question, suddenly you just feel that you need to make a right turn or a left turn. Still science fiction at that level, but a lot of really serious people are aiming there, which means that it's something that we should start imagining and thinking about right now. So, so you mentioned uh, Elon Musk in the last two weeks, indeed uh, his idea and, and uh, Neuralink really 
brought a lot of discussion to, to, to the news, uh, maybe better than discussing other things. Uh, you know, people have been uh, sending a lot of uh, questions and saying, even with, before you mentioned Elon Musk, it is scary. What about our privacy? Uh, is it ethics? Uh, what are the negative impacts? So can you, you know, try to relate to that and maybe put a little bit more in, in, a, in, the, in the right context? So those are great questions. And I almost feel like this is perfectly timed with the conclusion of kind of what we said. We, we spoke about all the things. And I think that the question that I was hoping will come up, and I think it, it's that question right now, is, is it good or bad? So a uh, f- f- disclaimer that I should say, uh, uh, full disclosure, sorry, I should say before, is that I'm partially involved with some of those initiatives like Elon Musk and, and, and some of the other ones. So I, I'm in a way with a foot in the door there. And still, my take would be that it's uh, risky and that it's not something that we should go lightly into without even a kind of stopping and and pressing pause every now and then and saying, do we want it? So here is the the thing. Uh, I'm on the camp that says that uh, using devices inside the brain and uh, enhancing thinking is extremely valuable for those who are in clinical desire. If you lost your ability to move and we can restore your ability to move, there's no question that you should do that. If uh, you're unable to hear and we can regain uh, hearing or we can fix a, deaf, a, a blindness by creating co- a, a neural sorry, implants in your eyes, that retinal implants that basically make you see, no doubt, there I'm on board. When it comes to putting a chip in your brain that will actually be a GPS and will give you directions on how to go to places and you will be better navigator, or maybe give you access to Wikipedia so you can ask the question, when was, uh, I don't know, French Revolution and the answer 1789 will just emerge in your brain and you think it's yours, but actually it came from the internet. Or even if you're a stock trader and you just can do high frequency trading in your mind because you have a better brain and suddenly become richer, I don't know. So even though I'm spending a lot of time helping those teams get there, I feel that the risks that it will pose are greater than the uh, benefits. So even though it will make a lot of us very smart and very capable and maybe even lead to us solving problems that we cannot solve with our regular brain that is just, you know, between 100 to 150 IQ normal brain, what is this loser brain that we have compared to the uh, super brain that uh, the companies are going to give us with 500 IQ points that can solve all of the world problems. I think that the price of that might be uh, high if it leads to uh, tremendous inequality. So right now we're experiencing inequality in the world. When it comes to money, you have rich people that are overwhelmingly richer than uh, the rest of the world. And it leads to total uh, unfairness in many dimensions. We have never experienced inequality in smartness. Kind of everyone in a way is living in the same bracket of IQ and the same uh, uh, thought processes. We have not seen humans who can communicate brain to brain without language or can just uh, per- outperform everyone else by having thoughts that we cannot even conjure in our minds. Having those devices in our brain could take us far out of this window and such inequality could be devastating for the world. So as a scientist, I'm still pushing the envelope to understand it. But as a civilian, a citizen, I do my best to bring those questions to everyone. So together we can decide how to regulate that, stop that, pause that, and control it so it won't become a kind of a technology that runs array without anyone uh, having the reins on that. Great, I think we have the time for uh, one last question. I'll, I'll take one uh, last question from the audience. So can we experience, not only experience, you know, the dream cognitively, but we really mediate on that and, and you know, experience the feeling and maybe uh, give, it might give the dream uh, different meanings. It might help us in, the, in our conflict uh, resolution. So do you think this type of thing might happen and how? So that's a perfect one. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna use this question, this question as a, a stepping stone to even a concluding sentence. So I'll say the following. There are six theories right now that scientists battle uh, on and what dreams are for. And they range for- theories, so take it into oh. account. Okay, so I'll quickly, uh, I won't launch all six of them, but they, they, they go from like the dreams are a way for us to remember things better, to simulate futures, uh, they mean nothing, they just are a way for our brain to organize itself, many theories, and, and each theory has some kind of evidence from one research, but contradicts another research, so we don't know the answer, we don't, we don't know what they're for, but what we can all agree 
is that uh, dreams uh, are serving some purpose, that our brain is making those movies for us for, for some reason that we, can, that we find meaning when we wake up. So whether the dreams themselves mean something, we attribute meaning to them. When we wake up, we say, oh my God, I dreamt about my grandmother. We think it means something. We, we come up with narratives in the real world to, to explain them. And therefore, I think that having access to the true content, to what actually your dreams were, uh, having some control over them will be useful even if we end up learning that the dreams themselves are just a way for the memory to actually reignite itself. Because we tell stories about them when we wake up, I think they mean something. And here is my last uh, kind of uh, conclusion. What we spoke about are ways that neuroscience can be used by many people in fascinating ways, I think, uh, in a future that is kind of fantastic. Some of it is still science fiction, uh, some of it is real. There's a saying uh, among my colleagues in Hollywood that uh, the difference between science fiction and science is timing. So I believe that over time, we'll see more and more of those magical ideas becoming a reality. But what it all uh, ends up with is uh, technologies that whether you understand the brain or not can be used by you. So the people who listen to us right now don't have to be neuroscientists. They have to either understand what are the capabilities and how they can use them and what are the tools that are available to and in that sense, I think that my quest for everyone, and I know that Tel Aviv University has a fantastic business school led by Moshe Tzviran that is really looking into that. I think that what I encourage everyone that's listening to us is to think of ways that you can supplement your existing work without taking any risk by exposing yourself to those ideas. So you don't have to kill your budget for marketing as it is and replace it with neuroscience, but maybe allocate a small amount to also testing something in neuroscience. And more than anything, keep your finger on the pulse of what is happening in the Sagol School in other places in the world so you can see the advantage because they happen so, so fast that a year of not reading about it could be the difference between you not knowing something that is remarkable that will change your business world. And the call, I think, for this seminar is to be aware of that, maybe play with it if you can afford to do it. And more than anything, I think, think about those issues as customers and as managers, so you can weigh in on whether this should be a reality in our world or not as citizens. And to me, this is the important last kind of a message from this one hour together. Thanks a lot. I think you brought a lot of uh, discussion points for the next webinar. So um, Jennifer, back to you. Thank you, Uri. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Uri. Thank you, Mohan. Uh, and thank you to our friends who joined us today. We, as usual, will be sending everyone a link to today's webinar, and it will also live on the AFTAL website, so please feel free to check that out. Uh, we at uh, Tel Aviv University and its American friends are wishing everybody a happy, healthy, and a sweet new year. Shana Tova, and all the best for a wonderful 5781. Shana Tova. Shana Tova, everybody.